everyone for coming tonight. I'm very excited that we're all here. And our subject tonight is gicle printing. And um, we're going to go over what the word gicle means and go through all the things related to preparing a gicle, you know, your files, and talk about resolutions so of the technical things. Um, and this is sponsored by Manal Art Printing, where we print for the professional photographers and professional artists, and Canvas Zoo, which is our company that prints for the general public. People email us their photos from all over the country, it's JPEGs, and we print them on Canvas and ship them off. And if anyone wants a tour of our facility afterwards, we can do that. And we can look at the printing room and look at the where we stretch the canvases and go through the whole process. I'll have some photos in here which kind of go through it, but it's nice to see it live and see our big printing machine. And, all that kind of thing where we spray the canvases. So if anyone wants to stay a little bit afterwards, we'll, we'll give you a tour. So here are some of the subjects we're going to go over in our presentation. What is a gicle? Some history about gicles and how the term came about. Art reproduction, photography, the gallery wraps, which is uh, how you uh, wrap a, a canvas around the sides, the, the uh, frame and the image on the sides. We'll be talking about RGB and CMYK resolution, digital capture versus scanning, art papers, photography papers, the mirror wrap, stretcher bars, and blah, 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 and, and so on. And you're welcome to ask any questions as we go along. I welcome questions. I don't want anyone to uh, uh, you know, have some blah, questions. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Just get down to it. <laughs> you know, sometimes if you have a question, you get stopped right there, and I don't want anybody to get stuck, you know, like 10 slides ago. So feel free to bring up any questions that you have as we go along. So um, we're going to go over the history and the origination of the term gicle, and that's how it's said, gicle. So this goes back to the 1980s with Graham Nash from Crosby, Stills, and Nash. He was a photographer, still is a photographer, and he took a lot of pictures while he was on tour and took pictures of his own band and other bands and got quite a collection of uh, interesting photographs. And he started getting them onto his Macintosh computer, but he found there's no way to print them. You know, I can do cool things on my computer, but back in that day, well, how do I print it? You know, the desktop printers did a crappy job, but he wanted to do, like, fine art printing. So um, this is where it all began with his tour manager, Matt Tolbert. Uh, the two of them uh, endeavored to find a way to uh, print the photography. And so what they did was they uh, hooked up with Iris Graphics and this model 3047, which was used in the pre-press industry. Um, back in those days when you wanted to print a brochure or postcards or annual reports, um, the earlier technology was to make uh, these sheet films, you know, and stack them up to get the color. And that was very time consuming and expensive. And so <coughs> this was the first digital pre-press proofing machine. And it's called the... Uh, Iris Graphics 3047, which meant that it could print up to 30 inches by 47 inches. And at that time, it cost $126,000. And so when uh, my wife, Jerry, and I had our market communications firm, we would send our proofs out to be proofed on this particular machine. So we were very familiar with it at the time. So um, Nash and Holbert decided to call their fine art prints digigraphs. And another fellow who worked in their studio named Jack Dugain decided a better term was gicle. And um, I spoke to some of these guys when I was doing an art show out in Las Vegas. And um, they told me that what they did was they went through a, a French dictionary looking for a cool word that, was, <laughs> that they could use to describe these prints. And they didn't want to call them inkjet or computer generated because that had kind of a, a cheap and a inexpensive sound to it. You know, and here they were looking to create fine art prints, so they needed to come up with something marketing-wise that sounded cool. So they came up with uh, gicle, and it means in French to spray, or it means nozzle, to squirt, to spurt. So this concept of spraying uh, like an inkjet printer would without using the word inkjet. So um, hence the word gicle was coined back in uh, the late 80s. And these are some of um, uh, Van Nash's photographs from this tour, and they're later published uh, when they printed them and had shows, and they went into a book called Life on the Road. So today, uh, Nash Editions is still around, and they're still printing, and they now use uh, Epson printers like we do, and they use the same canvas brand that we do. So that's kind of cool that they're using the same printer, the same inks, and 
materials to print on that we do at Canvas Zoom and all our printed. So what is the sheet clay? Well, the term is used to define a reproduction, a digital reproduction of artwork using digital media and inkjet printing, basically. And the name originally applied to the fine art prints that they made on that iris 3047, but has since then come to mean any high-end inkjet print. And the term is used by artists and galleries and print shops to denote a high-quality fine art print. So let me just interject at this point that this is different from your desktop, desktop printers that you have at home because they use dye-based inks. And these printers use pigmented-based inks, which have the longevity that you need you know, for fine art. You want to be able to last 25, 50, or 100 years before you get any noticeable fading. Whereas your desktop printer is using dye-based inks. I know from uh, experience hanging my kids' photos on my refrigerator, sometimes even after three or four months, they'll, they'll start fading. So I want to go over this uh, Giclée workflow uh, briefly. And I think this is a good way of uh, leading us through the presentation of terminology and the information we want to go through today. So we're basically talking about artwork and photography. Um, and that's, you know, the people who come in here are artists and, and photographers. And a photographer will come in with their digital files typically on a CD or on a uh, USB drive or on their camera or some means. And so then that goes directly into to prep, where we get it on our computer, we look at it, and we try to evaluate the color, it's going to print the way uh, um, the photographer expects it to, you know, and we size it up for printing. And then it goes into our print department, and we go into making a proof. Now, if an artist comes in, they may be walking in, you know, with a canvas, a piece of artwork, or watercolor, or pastel, or whatever, pencil drawing, whatever it might be. And then we, we have to digitally capture that to get it into the computer to work with it and to print it. So we do one of two things. We do a digital capture using my high-end digital camera, uh, 21 megapixel camera, or we have a flatbed scanner, and I'm going to talk about each of those options in a little bit. So here we have an artist arriving with her artwork. She walks in the front door, and she's got her uh, pastel there. Some of you may have recognized her. And here we have uh, the artwork on my easel in my photography area, and we have two umbrellas, and we have the camera on the stand, and uh, uh, the camera that I have is uh, very good at reproducing color, capturing the correct color, and I have a little gray scale in here, and usually I write down the size of the picture, so later on we know how big it is, afterwards we may not know looking at the screen. So we digitally capture it, we get it on the camera, and then uh, we bring it into our print room. Now I just want to show this to show all the different ways that people bring photos to us, if they already have it in a digital format. You know, they can bring in, some people bring in their cameras, they bring in their compact flash cards. Um, there are quite a variety of ways to bring in it. Some people can come in with their iPhones or their iPads. And I can hook up my computer and, and in Lightroom I can pull up those images and we can, we can use them. So here we are prepping the files and this is an example of that same piece, uh, piece of artwork. And uh, here on the computer I'm looking at uh, how it looks on the screen, I'm looking at the original and I have a color balance light next to my computer. That's an hot light and it uh, matches uh, the light you know, coming from the sun. It's daylight balanced. And that's important too in how you uh, evaluate color is your, your light source that you're using. How do you, excuse me, yep. do you use that with the computer? What were you saying? I know what an hot light is. I use one. But oh, okay. How do you mean that you used it with the computer screen? Right. Well, not shown here to the left. I have my hot light and I have the original right next to the computer. Oh, so, you're color testing so I'm comparing with my eye how it looks, the original versus oh, on the okay. screen. Okay. And usually we're, we're pretty close, uh -huh. but sometimes some colors will be a little bit off. Uh, I find that the yellows aren't quite spot on, you know, and I can adjust those and make any adjustments that I need to make. And then I have my, uh, my little gray scale in here. And um, uh, artwork's a little bit different than photographs. And, Photographs, you know, if you study Ansel Adams, you're looking for a white point and a black point, you know, in the full tonal range. But I find with artwork, you don't have a full tonal range usually. Um, the blacks aren't pitch black, you know, they're not pure black. Usually they have some uh, color tint to it, you know. And painters are taught that. They don't use pure black because you get reflections from the sky and maybe there's a dark blue and it's not really a pure black or, or some other shade. 
Um, and usually the whites aren't pure white. So I've, I've learned over the years how to adjust artwork. You know, it's different than you would do um, most of the photographs. Yes? Well, what do you do when you haven't got either a black point or a white point in the photograph? OK, good question. Well, I look by eye, and I compare the original to my screen. And usually, uh, usually I have all the information. If you're used to looking at histograms, some of you know what I'm talking about, the photographers that usually my camera has captured all the information is the, is in, that's in the, in, the, in the scene. And then I can adjust my white and black point by, by pulling them in. But on paintings, I don't do that because I know there's not a pure white point usually or a pure black point. So uh, I don't adjust it that way as I would as a photographer usually. And uh, I'm comparing it to the original so I can see how it looks. All right, so I'm adjusting colors needed, adjusting the tonal range. Uh, I size the image for printing, and we have the gallery wrap for canvas. And uh, Kate does a lot of that work uh, up here too. She's I don't know if she's still here, but she was here yes. a minute ago. Yeah. <laughs> and Kate um, is really great in setting up a lot of the artwork for for printing. This is Kate, Hi. and she's great at. Uh, retouching photographs and doing restorations and we do a lot of photo restorations here. My favorite. Yeah. Oh, this second slide was showing a photograph so I don't uh, leave out the photographers. Here was art. There's photography. <laughs> but uh, once it's in the computer it's a, a similar process in setting it up. And then uh, I want to talk about monitor calibration which is very, very important. Um, this is kind of an extreme example, but an uncalibrated monitor could look like this when it really should look like this. And this explains why uh, you often don't get what you're expecting to get, you know, when you're looking at your photography or artwork on your monitor. I had an experience once um, with my artwork, this is all my artwork by the way, with an interior designer out west and uh, she had me do some custom pieces for her and I sent out a paper, I know, I, I emailed her a proof. And she goes, oh, the colors, you know, this just isn't right. This isn't what I was expecting. So I redesigned the whole thing, hours and hours, and I email her another one. She goes, oh, this still isn't right. I don't know what's wrong, you know. And I do it a third time, email it to her, and she says, I don't know why we're so off track, but the colors aren't right. And I do it a fourth time, and I go, oh, man, I should send her a paper proof, you know. <laughs> so after that experience, I learned that, you know, I really should make paper proofs on the same printer that I print the canvases and send it out there. And so I sent all four of them to her. And she said, any one of these would have been perfect. <laughs> Her monitor was way off. It wasn't showing the color correctly. So that can be devastating if your monitor or your client's monitor, if you're trying to you know, send JPEGs for evaluation out to a client. If their monitor is way off and you don't know it, that can screw everything up totally and, and destroy your, your deal, your opportunity to sell, sell the piece. So if you're serious about it, you should uh, you know, look into calibrating your monitor. And some of the monitors have a simple process and that you can buy some instruments to help you get it even more accurately. Question. Yes. How does that work with parents? Well, if you go through um, system preferences and go to monitors and color, they have a little procedure you can go through and you slide these little bars, you know, and you make, you know, these patterns disappear and whatnot. And you can go so through that. Built yeah, and you can get it uh, closer than it would be ordinarily. but. Uh, it doesn't compare to having a proper system for doing it. And there are a number of them out there, uh, and this is what they look like, is they have a little device here which you hang over the front of your monitor and put it in a target area, and then the program that comes with it displays a bunch of uh, color target squares. You know, it might go for like 32 color squares or, or even more. And by measuring that and knowing what it's supposed to look like, it can determine how um, how far off your monitor is and build these calibration curves to adjust for those. So that is a great way to go about it. It's a godsend. Years ago, 10 years ago, these used to cost like $4,000 and now they're down to like a couple hundred bucks. Uh, the, a lot of us here are FCCP members. Uh -huh. The $50 annual membership gets you uh, monitor calibration. Really? Uh, yes. You mean as a service or as a product? As a service. As a service. Okay. Yes. As a service. What is that? Tell them about FCC. Tell them about FCC. Oh, you go ahead. 
Florida they want to know what your FCC Florida is. Florida Center for Creative Photography. There you Jack go. Donald, yeah, it's a meetup group that a lot of photographers belong to, and they meet up at regular meetings and photo walks and that sort of thing. And I guess one of the services they offer is they will calibrate your monitor for wow. you. So that's kind of cool. All right. So let's talk about RGB and CMYK. And some of you may be familiar with these terms. Um, RGB stands for red, green, and blue. And your camera shoots RGB. And there are different flavors of RGB. Um, but I don't want to get too technical with that right now. But there's another, another thing called CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And those are used in the printing industry. And if you're preparing like a brochure, you need to convert everything to CMYK so it prints properly on, on these printing machines. And these are called stations. And one is cyan, one is magenta, and one's yellow, and one's black. Now, if you're um, printing with us, well, our printer has 11 different inks in it. It doesn't have just four. So if you're converting it to four, you're throwing away some information and you won't get the broad color gamut that you do otherwise. So we prefer it to be in the RGB format. And uh, our computer and our printer decides how to divide those colors up, separate them out to the 11 colors that our printer uses. So don't try to see them YK unless you know what you're doing and there's a reason to do that. <laughs> All right, so resolution. Resolution refers to the number of pixels in an image. And here you can see it blown up really big, and you can see each of the pixels. And the word pixel is a made-up word from the words picture element. Picture element, pixel. So any digital picture is made up of pixels, which are squares of a single color. Each one of these is a single color. And together, they make up a picture. And if you zoom out, then you can start to see how the eye is fooled by these little squares to make up a picture. Oops, wrong way. You can see this is a blown up picture of uh, my son, and you can see the individual pixels. And when we see that, we use the word uh, pixelization to describe that what we're seeing is something that we object to, seeing these picture elements. You know, we really don't want to see that. So some people will email us a photo to print on canvas, and it's only like 500 pixels wide. And you know that's something that you, like you see on an internet website or something like that. But it's really not enough to print a large enlargement, because you're going to start seeing these pixels. So resolution is something you need to pay attention to. And, um, I think a lot of people here are familiar with that to a degree. But. So here um, you can see the, the pixels, and we pull out a bit further, and it's a little soft. And here we're starting to look like photographic quality, and we step out further, and it, uh, it's an amazing um, photograph with high resolution where you're really satisfied in knowing that's a high resolution uh, image to look at. So, we did some tests here to see, well, how much resolution do you need? In the printing industry, you know, where we had that printing press here, they always said 300 dots per inch. So, you have 300 of those little squares per inch in your image, and that's what they're looking for. Now, I just decided that, well, let's really take a look at that and see what's really needed. So, what I did was, uh, I made this uh, example here, and I actually have have these squares here, and I'll pass them on. You can take a look at it. And at 25 dots per inch, 25 of those squares per inch, it looks fuzzy, it looks pixelated. You can see little little jaggy artifacts. I would describe that. When you get to 50, it's better. 75, it's so-so. But once you get up to 100, it starts looking pretty good. Uh, between 100 and 200 is very, very acceptable. This artwork here is only printed 120 dots per inch. Most people are amazed to hear that. And if you look at it up close, you don't see any of this pixelization or any of those artifacts that you see in the low-res picture. So we print a lot of things at 120. Uh, 140 is really good. We print a lot of things at 140 DPI. Um, particularly on canvas, it looks awesome. If you're going to print on a, um, like a glossy photo, or on glossy photo paper, and you're going to be looking at it up close, you know, or maybe looking at a loop, you might want to be more in the 200 range. But anything beyond 200 is usually just wasted. Um, and it just takes more processing time. And you got bigger files. And 
definitely do not want to uh, up res your file to 300 dpi. I mean, he had someone come in with a 30 by 40 inch image taken from his camera, and he up res it to 300 dpi, and it was over a gigabyte file. You know, it took five minutes to get it out of my computer, and you know, it's just unnecessary to up res it. <laughs> And it's like overkill. It's overkill. Yeah. And especially if you're up it, what, what happens is uh, Photoshop, or whatever image editing or pro program you're using, interpolates it. So it's, it's making up pixels because they aren't there. Right. So it could be doubling the number of pixels. So it has to guess what those colors should be. So it's going to make errors and it's just not going to be that great. I mean, sometimes you need to do that, but I'd rather have you send me all the resolution that you have and then we'll size it to whatever we're printing to. And if there's any question, we can always take a look on our screens and evaluate the resolution and, and let you know or let you see, you know, looking at it together, how it's going to look at a particular size. Yes? Maybe you'll get to this, but what's the, um, how much of a difference is there in resolution when you shoot in RAW versus in JPEG? Well, I've done some tests with that, and uh, in the early years I wasn't convinced, but uh, in recent times I'm totally convinced that raw is the way to go if you're prepared to handle raw files. Now if you shoot a raw file, um, the advantage is, is that all the information that's captured from the camera is all there. And on your camera you have settings and you're setting the color balance, you know, or the camera's doing that for you. Um, it's, it's doing a lot of things and then it's saving with those changes in it to a JPEG and you can't go back and undo those changes, but with a raw file you can. You shot, you know, with it with the wrong color balance. You can go back with a raw file and change it. You can do all kinds of things. So uh, it captures more information. It's a sharper image. Uh, not having been saved as a JPEG, you're not losing any information. When you shoot a save a JPEG, it's compressing it to make the file smaller. And what it does is it looks through the image and says, okay, the next 10 pixels going across are white. So instead of saving every, every pixel. We're going to save a, a little text file saying the next 10 pixels are white, you know, and that saves a lot of information and can make a smaller file. So it's going through there trying to figure out um, how to do that, and you're losing a little bit of information when you do that. And most, a lot of times you don't see that, but um, when you're blowing up things really big, it, it can make a difference. So if you're prepared to shoot raw, I would do that, and it helps if you have... Uh, you know, the Adobe RAW file converter or Lightroom or some means to do that. It takes a little more time to, to deal with it, but if you're prepared to deal with that, it's a far superior way to shoot. Sometimes when you send a file into a magazine, it'll ask for 300 Okay. Okay. Is that an or? Well, what happens is, um, according to their industry, they need 300 dots per inch. But they want to have the opportunity, if they need to, to make it larger and resize it. So if you give them 600, then they can go twice the size and still get 300. See, so that's why they ask for that. I'm going to pass these around while I'm talking. And you can see the uh, 25, 50, 75, 100, and, and so on. And you can look at it and compare the difference. And I think everyone will agree, once you get above 100, you're doing pretty good. And if you're in the middle of range, you're, you're doing really well. Okay. So, prepping a gallery wrap. So, a gallery wrap canvas is a canvas print where the canvas extends around the sides into the back of the stretcher bar frame. Now, this is a stretcher bar frame. Uh, we'll be talking about this a little bit later, but the canvas, this is what's behind the canvas. The canvas gets stretched around and stapled on the back. So, what we're talking about here is having image on the side here, like on the artwork. Here's a white canvas that's been stretched, and you can see how that looks to get the idea. And you can have, if you have enough image area, you can have what you would normally crop off go around the sides. You can add white to the sides, or black, or a color, or you can mirror image. And we're going to talk about it in a second and show you how we mirror image. So here's a gallery wrap canvas with a black edge, which uh, is a nice look sharp, clean look. And then here's a mirror edge. And what we've done here is, since we didn't want to crop this image because we liked it and we didn't want to crop into it, what we do is we copy two to three inches into the image and then paste it and reverse it around so it goes around the sides and the back of the canvas. 
Now, when you're looking at it, this particular angle, it kind of looks funny because you get these lines, but when you have it hanging on the wall, it actually looks really nice. And um, we all love, um, I do at least, like the calorie wrap look. It's a nice contemporary look and you don't have to frame it. And we'll talk about framing a little bit later. Framing can add or detract from the, from the picture. Yes? The, uh, the mirror image, what I've done sometimes on some of my prints is when I haven't got enough to get my three inches mm -hmm. say, from the, the border, right. is got a, an area at the side of the photograph mm -hmm. and done a contact aware film. Oh, yeah. That's a good so idea. So that gives you enough to go around them. Is that a, an acceptable way of doing it? Sure. Whatever looks great is an acceptable way. <laughs> So sometimes we'll we'll clone the image, you know, and, and copy and, and clone it, you know, to get more around the edge. Content where fill is a good way to do it. Um, there are a number of different ways of doing it. Uh, we have a program that helps us that can expedite the whole process, and it'll automatically mirror wrap all the images. And some of them you can specify that you also want it to be uh, uh, blurred, you know, or motion blurred. Yes. Yeah, it's a real pain. We can photograph the edges and then stick them together, but it's really time consuming. And we might charge a little extra to do that. <laughs> All right. I suppose you could take the canvas off. And then we can do it. All right, so here's an example. This is a photograph that I took, and I'm going to go through the steps of uh, doing a mirror gallery wrap. And what I do is, uh, Called a, a marquee, called marching hands. And what we do is we copper copy in uh, three inches, and then what we're going to do is paste it and flip it over. So we got it and it's flipped over. You can see the uh, symmetry line here. And we do it again for the uh, other side, and then the top. Got a little smaller, but you can see the symmetry line here on the top, and then we add the bottom. And sometimes it looks a little funny when it's lying flat, but when you have it wrapped, you know, it goes around the sides, it usually looks great. Well, there are a couple instances that can cause a problem. Like, say, if you have somebody's hand here, and the hand gets copied, and you see fingers. I can see that. So usually we retouch that and touch those fingers out, you know, some body part gets transfer to the side. <laughs> so those are the, some of the things that we have to deal with and can take us a little bit more time when we want to not have funny things happening. So, and then I just threw these lines on to show where this is the front face of the canvas and this is the sides and the, the bottom. So um, we will do this for you. If you send us an image, we'll handle all that. Some photographers like to take total control and do it themselves, but we're happy to handle that for you as, as part of our price and producing it for you. But if a photographer sends you the image mm -hmm. with his perception of what the gallery wrap should be, yep. where the lines of demarcation, how does he identify the, where those lines are to you? The, well, he, the marquee won't be there, will it? No. Well, we used to put guidelines, those blue guidelines in Photoshop, and we'll leave them there. Or some people leave them there so we kind of know where it is. But if they've, uh, if we've talked and we had an agreement that you're going to give us three inches on all sides, then it should be, it should work out. But that's the point. It's three inches. So you can go to the extreme of the, of the image and count back right. three inches instead of going to going out. Right, you um, prep a 16 by 20 canvas, you know, and we're going to, the 16, it should be 17, 18, 19, 21, 22, 22 inches all the way across, you know, and then we'll measure and, and make sure that it looks looks right, okay. and, and if you've done it right, it should, and if it isn't right, then we'll either fix it or, or talk to you and, and work it out so it is right. And that's one of the things that uh, separates us uh, from the, some of the uh, lower cost uh, places that makes you plays is we want to make sure and guarantee that it comes out right and we'll take the effort to, to fix it or get together with you and, and work it out so it is right. 
Okay, so uh, going back to our GCLA workflow, we've walked down through uh, you know, getting the digital file into printing, and now we want to make a proof. And so we almost always print a proof to ensure that what we uh, see on the screen is what we get in the final output. And if we have like a painting, we often have the painting here so that we can compare them and, and make sure that it's, it's working out well. And sometimes we print several proofs until we're satisfied. And you know it's costly and time consuming for us to do that, but we want our reputation is on the line. We want to make sure it comes out right. So we'll take that time to do that. Um, you know, if you go to some uh, Walgreens or someplace, they're certainly not going to do that. They just print out what you get, and you get what you get. You know. <laughs> so we're not the least expensive place, but we're here to guarantee that you get the results you're looking for, something that you can be proud of, and something that you can sell. When you proof, do you proof on the same material that you're going to print on? Um, depends. You know, sometimes if we feel confident, we'll just print on the white acid-free paper, and we know that that looks 99.99% uh, as it would up print on the canvas. But if something's really critical, or the texture of the canvas might influence your perception of it, then we'll print a proof on canvas. But most mostly on the white paper. This is going back just a little bit, but is there a difference between a clay and an archival pigment? I was entered a show at the Deneen Fine Art Center, and everything in a show like that is usually individual. Mm. There was one print, an, ar uh, an archival pigment print, mm -hmm. and my friend Darlene and I said, hmm, that's a you play. Yeah. That shouldn't be here. Yeah. Okay. That's most likely the case. Okay. That's just a fancy name. Yeah, some people, for that reason, don't want to call them you plays because doesn't sound, it's become too common a term now. It has become very common. I mean, I yeah. like archival pigment print, right. but... I believe it's the same, but you actually have to talk to them to find out if it is. Yeah. But it sounds like they're trying to give a little... Uh, that little class to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. it is a classy thing if it's done right. Yeah. So it, it should not be on the original. Right. It's worthy of further investigation. Yes. <laughs> talk to the jury. What's the difference? It's just another name that people are starting to use for GK because they don't want to use the word GK anymore. It's just become too common. Oh. Archival. What did you say? Pigment. Archival pigment print, which is a kind of, it's not, it is, it is an ink. Yeah. Oh, but, but pigment. Well, our printer uses a pigmented ink, so I mean, you could call it a pigmented print. And it is archival ink, so you could call it archival pigmented mm -hmm. print. Yes. I see, I see that as a as distinction. One second. As opposed to what? As opposed to a toner. Toner. Is that what you call the other? Oh, a dye. Dye. Yeah. Yeah. I see what she was talking about as a distinction without a difference, because if you have a good inkjet printer, mm -hmm. uh, I have a Epson 1400, okay. which is not expensive at all. Right. Six inks. I can get a set of cone pigment inks, plug it right in print it on good archival paper, and I've got an archival pigment print. Correct. But it's not a G-clay. You could call that a G-clay. Yeah, maybe I could, but what, for what purpose? <laughs> Marketing. Is a G-clay something that is printed where all the colors are printed at once? They come out as opposed to a four-color press. Right, correct. Okay. It's a cliche. All, the whole <laughs> image is printed line by line. You get two extra points. <laughs> yeah, she plays becoming a cliche. So. Yeah. Always have to, have to always reinvent ourselves. Any other questions? Okay. So now we're printing the proof. That's not a proof, but this is the machine that we're using. And here's our proofing station. And we've got a color correct. Daylight balance light to evaluate this with. And we didn't always have that there, but we found that with the regular fluorescent lights were there, that the color wasn't matching well. And then we bring it out, out of the room to other fluorescent lights that look different over there. You know, and then we bring it outside and it look different there. And it was like a pain to try and match colors. I mean, you hold the original and you hold the print, and in one lighting situation they look identical, then you go to a different lighting situation and they look different. It's like, for 
flexing and frustrating. So we invested in the uh, daylight balance light, which is you know used in the graphic arts industry and you pay quite a bit for these bulbs. But it's a standard that they use. And it's daylight balance and it's a full spectrum light. If you look at the light that comes from regular fluorescence, there's a there are peaks in the blue area and it's missing some of the reds and it's kind of an unusual profile of the frequencies of light where this is a more uniform color balanced light with all the colors in the spectrum pretty much. Mm -hmm. Do you have to, uh, is it possible to use a regular fixture with those bulbs or yes. you can buy the entire? Yeah, this is a regular fixture from Home Depot with those bulbs in it. Oh, wow. Well, theoretically, you should turn off all the other lights, but we know that this is so much brighter than the other lights that, you know, it's fine for most uses. You know, and, and we painted the walls gray, and that's a good idea if you have a, 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 a room for evaluating color. There are a lot of things that can influence it. Like you're sitting in front of your monitor and you have a red shirt on. <laughs> that could even influence your perception of the color. Um, in my, in what I call my real life, do a lot of automotive stuff, and that all had to be color matched. So we had a booth with no other light and filtering than that. Yeah. And that was the only way to. We just we couldn't allow incandescent or fluorescent light to penetrate that area. So. Right. Good point. You got a little room, so you have that capability. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was definitely worth doing. Yeah, there were yeah, couples, you know, this on one circuit and the rest of the stuff on another circuit. Mm -hmm. So the other, when you're doing your color match or check, that you only have that light active in the area, I think is important. Right? Yeah, colors are a very, very interesting mm -hmm. subject. I've been yeah. interested in it for a long time being a photographer, and I started doing some tests, and I was like comparing my left eye to my right eye. And there's a tiny variance in color between my left eye and my right eye, not a lot. And you never notice it unless you're like really, really looking for it, you know, but I, you know, <laughs> looking at that before, and there's a little difference, you know, and then I was wondering, well, how much difference is there from person to person, you know, and then you've got some people who are colorblind and different vari variations of colorblindness. So uh, that's a very interesting question. Do the color you see is the same color that I see? You know, and I, I go to art festivals and I'm showing artwork and some people oh that's so bright I can't take it you know it's like whoa <laughs> what are you doing you know and, and maybe maybe their perception is different maybe it's it's too loud for them you know maybe that's why some people like very subtle colors it's hard to say but it's an interesting subject yeah, yeah. yeah. as an instructor I have to be very careful when I see a color I have a very good color sense I see a color yeah. and my student doesn't see it oh. I can explain it and yeah. then I have to tell them, you can choose to paint what I see or what you see. Yeah. It's, it's your choice. I had a friend who was colorblind, and he touched up his red car with black paint. <laughs> 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 he couldn't tell the difference. And he'd wear the gaudiest ties to work, you know, and he'd say, that tie doesn't go with your suit. You know, he'd go, looks fine to me, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. What compensation, if any, do you make based on where it's going to be displayed. That's an interesting what, question. What's your customer driving like? Yeah, we don't really worry about that too much. I mean, you haven't gotten to that fine level of detail on the display lighting. When you go to photo competitions, um, they have lighting with a certain <coughs> amount of candle power and that kind of thing. And, and the photo labs will make the prints differently if it's going to be an official photo salon competition. And the prints will be different, but for the most part, we um, don't usually make any correction or changes to a particular lighting situation. You know, if we were asked to, we can go into that, but it hasn't really come up. Okay, so we're in the proofing area, and here's um, where we compare them to the original. Any adjustments are needed. And um, despite monitor calibration and the print profiles, I should probably mention print profiles. Um, like what Graham Nash did in the early days is he was trying to figure out how to get these printers to print the color the way he expected it. And these uh, pre-pressed machines just quit print on watercolor paper. It looked like, it looked awful. You know, and then they went to coating the papers, you know, so that the ink would sit properly on it and, uh, you know, get the proper color. And then they discovered
discovered that the thing to do is create these color profiles. And what they do is they print out a whole bunch of color charts and they have a spectrophotometer measuring each of the colors, just like we do in calibrating the monitor, going through all these color sequences. And you can build a color table which will compensate for any discrepancies in the color um, you know, being printed versus what it really should be. So we have, it's called an ICC profile. ICC stands for International Color Consortium, and they set the standards for, for color. And we have a profile for our printer for each of the different materials we're printing on um, to compensate for the bias of each printing material. So despite having your monitor, your monitor calibrated, your print profiles for each type of paper or canvas, uh, we still have to make some small adjustments to make sure that we're getting precise color. And my friend used to say he was an art director, color doesn't happen by itself. <laughs> you always gang up your proofs? Not always. In this situation, we had a number of them, and uh, we decided to do that and could review them quickly that way. Yes? Canvas textures, are they different? Yes. Grades? There are different types of textures depending upon the manufacturer, and also can vary with the con cotton content of the canvas. 100% cotton will have a, a coarser texture than one that's a polyester cotton blend or, or polyester. And we're going to talk about uh, differences in that a little bit later. So, uh, so we've got our proof, and we've approved it. Now we're going to print our canvas or print our paper. And uh, let's see what the next slide does. Oh, we have to coat our canvases. When we print a canvas, it needs to be coated. And uh, the reason for that is... Uh, you need to increase the scratch resistance. They are a little bit, uh, I don't want to use the word fragile, but it, you can scuff them uh, if you're not careful. So you really want to coat them. And the coating also has a UV protection, which is ultraviolet inhibitors, which uh, reduce the amount of ultraviolet coming through to the pigments, which can degrade them over time. And uh, just a little side note, the, each of the colors fades at a different rate of speed. You've probably seen this with old prints you might have had that are 20, 50 years old that you know maybe they've turned blue or something because uh, the magenta pigments fade more quickly. Um, so with this UV inhibitor, we get really good results. And um, there's a fellow named Wilhelm who's done some testing with the different canvases and different coatings and whatnot. And uh, you know we're looking at many times 25 up to 100 years of estimated life before any noticeable fading. So we've gotten, people have always questioned that over the years. Well, what about the archival capability of your canvas? You know? And we're at the point now where I, I think it exceeds a lot of the uh, original fine art materials. You know, If you're doing watercolor, I don't know what the longevity of that is, but from what I understand, it's, it's probably not 100 years, <laughs> especially if you have any type of, of light. So we've gotten really good with our plays in terms of longevity. And... We use the original manufacturer inks. Um, a lot of companies, to save money, they'll buy third-party inks from some other manufacturer and buy them in bulk, you know, in gallons or quarts or something, and, and save a lot of money. But the problem with that is um, you don't often don't get the consistency from batch to batch or from year to year. And since we're printing for people and they might call us two years later and say, "Hey, can you print me another 20 by 30 of that image?" Uh, we want it to look, you know, like it did two years ago. So we don't want to be playing around with our inks and trying different things to save money. We want the quality, the consistency with the original manufacturer's ink. So a note about other canvas providers is um, many of the discount providers don't laminate their canvas at all. Um, I was thinking about ordering one from Walgreens just to see what it looked like and maybe bring it today, but I didn't have time. But I can't imagine them coating their canvas in the middle of Walgreens yeah. and spraying Spray. it with an automotive <laughs> spray gun like we do. So I don't think they're coated. I, I want to find out, but those will scratch very easily. You know, they don't have the UV inhibitors, and they'll fade. And they're not using uh, the most expensive inks. They're trying to get the prices down. Uh, canvas from other suppliers may be 100% polyester, and it really is couldn't be called a canvas at all. It has like a canvas texture. It's made out of plastic, and it doesn't hold up as well as canvas with a cotton content in it, and it just doesn't have the quality look or feel. And we bought a roll of uh, what they call production canvas, which is this 100% poly polyester. And I just, you know, I say, well, we can save money. We can, there's certain places where we could use it, and I just can't use it. And so they, it 
feels horrible. I, I just can't bring myself to use it. <laughs> so some of the discount providers use thinner stretcher bars made of MDF board. That's that artificial fake composite stuff with particles made of glue rather than pine to reduce cost. This is um, this is the stretcher bar material that we use. And it's, you can see it's, it's heavy duty. It's not a really thin thing. And what's really cool about this stretcher bar is it has a high lip on it, so the canvas is held away from the face. And if you don't have that big lip and there's any pressure on the canvas at all, you can start seeing a line here. You've probably seen that in some canvases. You can't spend much time with them. So we like this deep lip. And this stretcher bar has the added benefit is that this way you get a one and a half inch thick deep canvas. And if you flip the bar around, you get a two inch if you build the stretcher bar using it this way. These come in eight foot and ten foot lengths, and we, we chop them up and put them together with glue and with these bee nailers, which put these little you know, V-shaped nails into it and hold it together. That's a little bit about the stretcher bar. So here's a picture, and that's what I just showed you. So um, we used to have these built for us, but now we uh, we've actually acquired a frame shop, a frame company, a couple of weeks ago. And so now we're building these all in house. So we're going to be moving that whole facility up to here in the next couple of months, and we're going to offer full framing capabilities. And we get two new employees with that, and they're um, very experienced framers who have been doing it for many, many years. One of them used to work at a molding company that makes the molding that the frames are made out of, and they do really high end uh, specialty work as well as, you know, everyday things for photographs and um, lower priced things. So we're looking forward to having that and we're thrilled that we're able to have more control over our costs and our uh, uh, delivery receipt of these stretcher bars for our work. So here are three different thicknesses. We've got the three quarter inch, the one and a half, and the two inch. And um, the thinner one is particularly useful when you're going to be putting a frame on it. Uh, you, use, you can put a frame on these other ones, but you got a lot of extra bulk coming out the back. So the one and a half inch is very, very popular. That's probably what we do most of. Um, and then the two inch um, has a, a, for smaller pieces, it's kind of a fun, fun look, but the large, large pieces are often put on the, the two inch thick stretcher bar, so you have some, some depth from the wall when you're looking at each piece from a distance. Uh, we put the uh, wire on the back and include the, uh, the hook and the nail pretty convenient, so you, when you need yours, you don't have to be fishing around for that. All right, then we stretch the canvas, and as I was pointing out, um, stretch a bar is face down, and we wrap the canvas around, and we have to make sure it's centered properly, and we use a pneumatic uh, staple gun, and use our canvas stretching pliers to get that fairly taut. And then uh, art and photo papers. Um, we have quite a variety of materials that we print on. Not only canvas, but we have the smooth, fine art, acid-free paper, which is very popular for both artwork and photography. It has a good white point to it. Uh, and it reduces colors very, very well. And we have a textured fine art paper, which is like a, a watercolor paper with uh, quite a bit of texture to it. And I actually have some samples, which I can pass on here. There's the texture uh, on the top. So the textured fine art paper, as I said, looks like watercolor paper. It's great if you're putting a watercolor on it. Um, a lot of people think that it's an original when you print a watercolor on a watercolor paper. <coughs> and then we have um, your glossy paper. It's like a photo paper, which is nice, and a luster paper. We have a metallic paper, which is in that pack there too, which is really cool and interesting. And then we have a, a Tyvek material, which is which is really neat. And we've actually used that as wallpaper. What is that? It's kind of like those envelopes that FedEx things come in. And it's like you can't rip it. And now they've made it available for printing on it. It's got a printing coating on it. And as I said, you can put wallpaper paste on it and then stick it up and use it as wallpaper. It's a very durable and fun material to work with. Does it hide the fibers? Is it what? Does it hide the fibers? Um, we 
can show you some samples of it. Lot, yeah, there's a lot of little fibers. Yeah, you see it a little bit, but not as much as the envelopes. And then we have adhesive back material, which you can uh, peel it off and stick it on the wall. And it's amazing material because you can peel it off six months later and stick it on another wall. Wow. And there are many, many other materials that are available and that are coming out. So, as I mentioned, we now have framing capability. And um, presentation is everything. Proper framing can make a difference in making a finished and sellable photographic piece of artwork. Um, it's up to you to decide whether you want to leave it as a gallery wrap or add a frame. And now we can offer all of that here in one place. And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>